May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if you have one of these, then you'll probably understand our word for the day. And I think most of you probably have something that looks like this. And if you do, then you are no doubt familiar with this. Mine shows up in the upper left corner, printed almost exactly like that on the little black bar, no service. And that usually means that I am in one of these. And that's our word for the day, dead zone. Now, when I first got a cell phone many, many years ago, I, I would travel outside of a, a major metropolitan area, I would get into the country, and I would get this, right, a dead zone. There'd be nothing there. I, I couldn't communicate. It made me wonder sometimes why I had one. But of course, over the last few years, the communication companies have done a wonderful job of eliminating many, many of those dead zones. So now it's not as common, but yet there are still times when I can travel in central Texas or west Texas and still find no service and realize I am in a dead zone. In our lesson today, Jesus wants his disciples, and we'd include ourselves in this, to know that because of what he was about to do for them, he would eliminate dead zones for the children or for the people of God. There would be no place or time moving forward when God's children would ever be able, well, ever not be able to get through to God. They would have this, which is exponentially better than the four or five that I have. Well, let me set this lesson up in its context. Again, it is Maundy Thursday, and it, as it was in our discussion last week. Jesus has talked about many very deep topics around the Passover table, and this is one of them. Now, he began in the, in the verses in the chapter ahead of this, talking about going away. He, he was going to go away, and he meant, I'm not his ascension. He was going away, and he wasn't coming back till the end of the world, but he was doing that so that he could send the Holy Spirit, the special outpouring of which he was prophesying to them on Pentecost. So, after he had finished telling them this, th this, this idea that he was going away sort of troubled the disciples. And you probably caught that in the text as I read it earlier, but they were, they were, they were grieving, right? They, they didn't understand what Jesus meant by he was going away. Now, he, he again told them why this had to happen, but then he acknowledged their grief. You're, you're sorrowful because I'm going away. And this is where then our verses pick up. He said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. We're going to see that he's not now referring to the previous one when he says a little, when I was going to be gone. This is another time frame he's speaking of. Now at this, some of the disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And because I'm going to the Father, they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. Are you as confused by those words of Jesus as his disciples were when they first heard them? See, I tend to think that because we, we know a little bit more of the story, we know about what happens now with his, his, his uh, betrayal, arrest, his suffering, 
crucifixion, death, and burial, that, that we know what Jesus means about going away. We know about then his resurrection and his ascension, so we understand what he meant, means by coming back. But, but let's just make sure that we understand what Jesus is saying in all of this. So, Jesus was going away. That's true. As I noted, yes, he was going away just for this little, a short period of time. We'll, we'll get to that. But he would also then be going away to the Father. He would be ascending into heaven and he wouldn't come back till the last day. Now, we know that he was going to be betrayed. He was going to be arrested and tried and mocked and abused and convicted and crucified and he would suffer still more. He would die and he would be buried. All of that was going to happen within the next 24-hour time period from when he spoke these words. And then they would not see him. Though they would be witnesses of those events, after his burial, they would not see him for at least the better part of three days, to be exact. But then he would return. And then they would rejoice when they would see him. So, he, Jesus explains this to them in terms of a woman giving birth. He says, you know, when a woman is about to give birth, something really great is about to happen, she's in tremendous pain. And she's got all kinds of grief and sorrow over, over the fact that she's giving birth. But as soon as that baby is born and wrapped and put on her chest, the joy that fills her heart pushes the pain to the margins. And she just has that great joy in this thing that's happened. Jesus said, that's what it's going to be like for you. Just for this little while, you're going to be full of grief and sorrow. But when you see me again, you're going to be overjoyed. And they did. They saw Jesus again when he was raised from the dead. And they were. They had great joy. And Jesus said, that joy will never be taken from you. And as you read the rest of the book of Acts, you know, that joy was never taken away from them. That's, that's probably, then, what we understand when we hear those words, isn't it? And it's not wrong. That, that's the beginning of a correct understanding of what Jesus is saying here. But I think there's just a bit more here than we might pick up on if we don't go back and consider the context. Jesus said, in a little while you will see me again. What did he, he mean that a little while you will see me again? See with their physical eyes? What would they see? Well, it may seem that that's what he's talking about, but we, we realize in the next phrase, of verse 23, he says this, In that day you will no longer ask me anything. Now you might think, what has that got to do? How is that helping us understand? Well, in that day, when you see me again, he said, you will no longer ask me anything. And the word ask here is important. It's a Greek word that means to ask someone for information. So Jesus is saying, in that day when you see me, you won't be asking for more information. Now, we know that once Jesus rose from the dead, they had great joy. We know that they had a much better understanding of what was happening, but they're their understanding and their knowledge wasn't complete yet. It wasn't sufficient to carry out their work. In fact, at the ascension, they're still asking for more information. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They were still asking the question, but Jesus said in that day, you will no longer ask me anything. So that's the question I'm putting to you. What does Jesus mean in that day? Well, think. On what day did the disciples finally see Jesus and realize all that he was and all that he had come to do? And then on what day did they really stop, because they didn't need to, stop asking for more information because they had it, they understood it. If you're thinking Pentecost, you're absolutely correct. Jesus is referring to Pentecost. See, on the day of Pentecost, they had already seen Jesus with their physical eyes, but on the, the day of Pentecost, they would finally see him with the eyes of their heart, the eyes of faith. And then they would fully understand who he was and why he had come. And they wouldn't need to ask him for more information. They would be 
readily equipped to do the work that he had assigned them to do, to be apostles and evangelists to the nations. But Jesus continued. He said, very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. See, Jesus wanted to give his New Testament disciples a gift. And that gift was prayer. But not just prayer. Prayer, as he says, in my name. Now, we have to go back and ask ourselves or look at this other word that's called ask here. See, it's used three different times, huh? That word's not the same word he used before. This word for ask is, a, is an inferior asking something of a superior. It's a beggar uh, pleading to a lord or a noble for something. Interestingly enough, you might guess this, this word is never used when speaking of Jesus, talking to the Father. Because you see, Jesus was not an inferior to the Father. This is the word that's always used of believers talking to God. It's an accurate picture, isn't it? Aren't we all beggars? I mean, we, we have no standing before God. We have, we have no reason that he should answer us, listen to us, do anything for us. All we as beggars can do is simply throw ourselves at his grace and mercy and plead for him to hear us and to answer us. That's, that's all we can do. So it's a fitting word to use. And that's what Jesus is saying here. You, you ask like a beggar, but do it in my name. Now to, to further understand these words, we need to remember, first of all, something about prayer. Prayer has always been available to God's people since the beginning. In fact, he includes it in his law. It's something God demands that his people do. Uh, when he gave his second commandment not to misuse his name, he also gave the command to use it correctly. And he says, I want you to use my name correctly by calling on it in every trouble. Pray, praise, and give thanks. So Jesus wants, or God really wants us to pray. The trouble with the law, however, is that it's got really poor motivation for you and me. Because the motivation of the law is this, do it or else. Now you might wonder, well, why did anybody in the Old Testament ever pray then if they had such poor motiva motivation for doing it? And the answer is this, because along with his law, God also established a covenant of peace with his people, a covenant of grace and love with them. And it was that covenant of peace and grace that motivated his people to continue praying. And we know that they prayed and God listened to them and God answered those prayers. So, what's the difference then between that and what Jesus says here, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. God's people had always been praying. So, what does he mean, you have not asked for anything in my name? Well, it all comes to that key phrase, in my name. And that just begs the question, what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name. Now, obviously, at least I should think it would be obvious, it means more than simply tacking these words on to an end of a prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It, it certainly has to mean more, not that it doesn't include this, but it, it means more than just praying through faith in Jesus. Because remember, only believers, only people who have faith can pray. They're the only ones God hears and listens to and answers. And that's been true for all ages. So what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? This is what it means. It means to pray in the sphere of all that is Jesus. So I've got a little sphere up here. And in, it's everything about Jesus. Now remember, Jesus is more than a name. It's a reputation. It's more than a title. It's everything he's done. So to pray in the sphere of Jesus means to pray in the sphere of all that he is. True God and true man, Redeemer, Savior, Lord, Teacher, you can name it all. All of that is included when you pray in the sphere of 
Jesus' name. But it's a little more than that. It's also to pray in the sphere of all that he has done. So we think of starting it with creation, starting with uh, preserving the promise throughout the Old Testament. It, it includes his incarnation when he became human with us, his life, his suffering, death, resurrection, ascension, his ruling even now. All of that is included under Jesus. And so it's all that he is, all he has done, and, we'll add another one, all the blessings that he has secured for you because of who he is and what he has done. Now perhaps you got kind of an inkling as to why Jesus could say up to now, you have not asked for anything in my name. You've not begged in my name. It would have been difficult to do that since Jesus had not yet suffered, died, been buried, raised, ascended, and ruled from the throne in heaven. Now that was all going to happen, as we noticed, very quickly, in a little while. But until that was complete, and until Jesus had sent the Spirit at Pentecost, they wouldn't yet be able to ask for anything in His name. Friends, this is the gospel. To ask for things in Jesus' name in the gospel. And it changes everything for us. You see, our motivation for praying is not do it or else. You have to. But now because of Jesus and everything that is in his name, it's a want to, isn't it? When I consider all that he is, all that he has done, all that he has secured for me, I want to. I want to pray in Jesus' name. Well, but there's still more. When we pray in Jesus' name, it means that when we ask or beg, that we are asking and begging for things that are related to the kingdom of God, that are related to his rule in human hearts. And then it excludes praying for selfish purposes and goals. Although the, the disciples had not yet prayed in Jesus' name, the time was soon coming, and for us it has long since come, when the disciples of Jesus would ask the Father in Jesus' name, and whatever they asked, he would give it to them in Jesus' name. All of it. That phrase in Jesus' name here is referring to all of it. We ask, we beg in the sphere of Jesus' name, but then God listens. He hears us in Jesus' name. And He answers us. He gives us what we ask in Jesus' name, which means because of who Jesus is and what He has done and the blessings He has secured for us. That's what we're talking about here. So, yes, God hears us immediately, whenever we talk to him in Jesus' name. But he answers us in his time and in his way, yet he always answers. How can he not? You see, when you pray in, in Jesus' name, when, when you come asking him for, for things that are kingdom-related, when you come asking for things that give glory to him, that are in perfect alignment with his will, you know, in other words, he know, you know he wants those things, well then how can he not give you whatever you ask in Jesus' name? The fact is he can't. He will give it to you. Now, I'm going to say it once and I'll say it again later. This does not mean that God will give whatever you ask in the way or with the thought and intent that you had when you asked it. But he will answer your prayer. He will do that for you. So, Jesus then concludes, Ask in my name, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. When you pray for money, in Jesus' name, then you are asking the Lord to bless you with a certain amount of wealth, so that 
you can use that wealth to attain the, or to achieve the purposes for his kingdom and to give glory to him. Now, yes, that may mean providing for your family. But it also means supporting the work of his kingdom, outreach, ministry. It, it can also mean supporting charities, helping people who are in need. When you ask or pray for health in Jesus' name, you are asking for a health so that you can continue in, in your selfless service to God and to others. And again, God may not answer that prayer exactly the way you were thinking when you prayed it, but he will answer that prayer in the affirmative. And when he does that, when his kingdom comes not just to yours but to the hearts of others, won't your joy be complete? So, those of us disciples of Jesus who pray in Jesus' name, who pray in the confidence of his resurrection, know that he has put an end to dead and that he has eliminated all the dead zones for the children of God. So you can talk to God anytime, anywhere, under any circumstances. Several weeks ago, in one of my sermons I, I suggested, I made this little uh, sanctified suggestion that you would pray out loud. Remember that? Go find a quiet place by yourself and actually pray out loud. And there are several good reasons for doing that. But one is as a curb against the sinful nature. Now, I don't ask you to do something that I haven't been doing myself. So, that's typically how I pray. Most days, I pray out loud. When, when I pray, I assume, I just know, I trust, Jesus is sitting across the table from me in another chair. When I'm driving, I assume Jesus is sitting there in the passenger seat with me, listening to my prayers. When I'm sitting in a living room or in my office and I'm praying to, talking to Jesus, having conversations with God, I trust that he is in the chair across from me, listening to me. And when I do that, when I, when I get to hear my words in my own ears, I can very quickly pick up on hmm, maybe some, some sour attitudes, maybe the tone was a little irreverent, uh, or, or sometimes I realize, oh, Jesus sees right through my selfishness on that request, and I'm all... I, very often am compelled to repent of that immediately. The fact of the matter is, though, brothers and sisters, that none of us, as beggars before the throne of God, are ever going to be at, able to ask God perfectly for anything. You know, our, our, our sinful nature just seeps in to our prayers. Our emotions and our attitudes just ooze Sometimes that's justified, and it's right, but many times it's sinful. Our faith waxes and wanes. Our confidence does the same. Our weakness is evident when we pray. And, and so you might be left thinking, well, why should God ever listen to such double-minded disciples, such uh, fickle followers, such chicken-hearted children? And the answer is he shouldn't. He absolutely shouldn't listen to us. We have no standing before him. The only thing we deserve from God is the sword. We deserve his anger and his punishment because we can't hardly pray to him without sin getting in the way. But here's the brilliance of what Jesus has secured for us. Here's the brilliance of prayer in Jesus name in the sphere of Jesus when you and I beg we beg under the righteousness of Jesus God's son by which he has declared us righteous when we beg in Jesus name under the blood of God's son which purifies us from all unrighteousness and cleanses us from all sin when we beg before God we are standing in the doorway of God's Son's 
empty tomb by which he has secured God's favor and blessing for us. When we beg under the glory of God's ascended Son, who not only rules all things for our good, but also always stands before God interceding for us, we have the confidence then that our prayers are not only heard, but that they will be answered. And so, brothers and sisters, I encourage you to keep praying in Jesus' name. Keep praying in the sphere of all that Jesus is and all that He has done and all the blessings that He has secured for you. And in Jesus' name, God will not only listen to your prayers, He will answer them and your joy will be complete. You see, in Jesus' name, there are no dead zones. You always have full service. Let's pray about that. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your teaching this morning, your teaching even the night you were betrayed. We thank you that you have gone away for a little while, that you came back, you restored our joy, but then you have gone away and sent your Holy Spirit. And you have now secured for us this great blessing of prayer in your name. In all who you are and in all the things that you have done and all the blessings you have secured for us through the things that you have done. Lord Jesus, give us confidence to continue to pray to you in your name. And as we do that, you make sure that our prayers are heard before God in heaven as you have promised. And we know that when that happens, he will not only hear us, but he will give us whatever we have asked in your name. Lord Jesus, thank you. Amen.